my name is Rajiv Jairaman. I'm the founder and CEO of Nolscape. And I'm really pleased to let you know that we have uh, published a report on the impact of COVID on l &D. and uh, today we have um, you know, industry leaders who are going to weigh in on this topic. And I'm uh, absolutely delighted to have Ayas Khan Sarangi from uh, uh, Wipro Limited. He is the SVP for Leadership and Talent Management at Wipro. Thank you, Ayas Khan, for being part of this uh, webinar. Uh, we also have uh, Kavita Kurup, uh, Global Head Talent and Organizational Transformation at UST. Thanks for being here, Kavita. Uh, Manuni Patak, who is uh, Head of Talent and Leadership and Organizational Development from Trent Limited. Thank you, Manvi, for being here. And Chetna Munshi, who is the Director for uh, Global D DEI Learning Lead uh, from Ericsson. Thank you so much, Chetna, for uh, making the time for this. And we also have um, from Nolscape, uh, Ramya Lakshmanan, who is the Director for Customer Success. Thanks, Ramya, for being here. Right, so um, I'll quickly start off with the panel discussion. So I've got some interesting questions lined up and we will uh, get started without much further ado. Uh, so I, the first question is a rapid fire question. So we won't give the panelists too much uh, time. Uh, so in one word, how do you describe 2020? You're not permitted to use the words like unprecedented, new normal, all of the cliche stuff should be out. Um, in one word, how do you describe 2020? We'll start with uh, uh, Ayas Khan. That's a tough one, Rajiv. Um, first of all, thank you for the invite, really appreciate it. The one word for me would be humbling. Humbling, awesome. Uh, Kavita? So I'm going to give you one word, but I'm also going to give you a phrase because I'm sure you would have all heard it multiple times over the last few months. I heard it once at least every day, which is you're on mute. But okay. The, <laughs> okay. the word that really is transformative. Transformative, awesome. Uh, Manu, you want to go next? So uh, reinventing. Is the one word <laughs> reinventing? So did, did, did Manu take that word. word from you? Okay. So now you need to reinvent, Chetna. <laughs> I think uh, you already said new normal is not the word. Um, no. Back to basics. Okay, back to basics. We'll allow a phrase. Okay, uh, Ramya, what is it for you? A uh, lot of empathy. Empathy. Yeah. Okay, and for me, it is uh, was the year of learning, right? Uh, because we all carried some mental models in our head and we had to essentially relearn and unlearn mm -hmm. quite a few things. So, uh, you know, that's how I, I looked at 2020 at least. Great. So after having, you know, set that context, we'll quickly uh, move into the role of l and uh, I'd like you to weigh in on uh, how did the role of l and change in the context of the pandemic? What actually changed uh, because of COVID? Um, I just can't, we'll go, go through the same order. <clears throat> so I would break it up into three or four parts, uh, uh, Rajiv. The first is obviously a re-baselining of the LND function itself, right? Because the way um, we were spreading the concept of learning is very, very different from where it was in the past, right? So the first three or four months for us was a lot about re-baselining our own understanding uh, around on what would this change mean for us as an organization. So that was one big challenge learning for us. The second interesting learning for us was around the whole aspect of embracing that classroom as a concept will not exist for quite some time to come. Right? And I, I think uh, probably as a, as a function, we're kind of so used uh, to that model. Um, that, that was another uh, realization. The third one was a lot around um, appreciating that digital learning is here to stay. I think uh, that acceleration of that journey uh, is, at, is at a very, very different pace than where we even dreamt of it, widely imagined that would happen. And um, last but not the least, uh, um, I think because of the environment, everybody kind of got into a self-reflection mode in some shape or other. And that also helped in that journey because when you're self-reflecting, you're also trying to understand, hey, what aspects do I need to further look for? It could be on the softer side or it could be on the technical side, it doesn't matter. But that reflection at an employee level, at an individual level, um, also changed, uh, I would say, opinion on what this learning all about. Okay, so wonderful. In my view, those three or four things are what we kind of 
at a broad level line that. Dr. Eskan, so we'll um, hear from Kavita next. Yeah, I think uh, from an organization standpoint, we didn't really make much changes to our l and strategy. What we were doing before is what we continued doing. But I think what really changed is the individual pursuit of learning that people took on in their own space. Uh, people suddenly viewed a lot of time on their hands and said, how can we really leverage that? Because they didn't know how long it's going to last. I think when we started off the lockdown last year, around this time, we all assumed it was for a month or a quarter and not really that we'd be a year later and still worrying if another round is coming our way or not. Uh, to facilitate some of those conversations, we do did do a couple of programs. For example, we did 21 Days of Transformation where we said, hey, look at your travel time. That's something that you don't have anymore. And use that time and we will not ask you to take further time out from the, your schedule to learn, but just translate that. And these are some of the skills that you can build. And if you do do that over a period of time, we will help you find a bigger, better role. So those, I think also triggered a lot of things. And it was a lot of peer pressure, I think also, because everybody was posting about the new things that they were learning during the pandemic, right? So it was also a case of FOMO. So uh, in that context, I think learning has changed for all of us. Thank you, Kavita. Uh, over to you, Manvi. Yeah. Uh, so, no, I would agree with, you know, what both the uh, other two panelists have said. And uh, I, I think that, you know, it's a it was a very interesting time that because we did not know what to expect. And, you know, as Kavita said, we didn't know how long is this going to be. And uh, the entire journey has been very interesting because, uh, 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 like Josh Burson has said that, uh, you know, LND is one of the heroes in this crisis. So I completely agree with that because uh, right now, if you see, business is actually looking at LND to help the organizations uh, adopt to the new normal. We have actually tried out a lot of things uh, like, you know, there was informal learning, there was digital learning, and uh, we have actually realized that blended learning is going to be the way forward. And we also know that this is going to be there for some time. And uh, how LND will uh, change as a result of uh, all this totally depends on us. The crisis has actually given us an environment which uh, can be, you know, very terrifying or, we, or it can be very thrilling is how we adopt to this and how we handle this. So I personally feel that uh, LND is going to be taken much more seriously now. And I also feel that LND is also going to be under a lot of scrutiny because in 2021, as we see our budgets closing, a lot of uh, things which are getting discussed right now is in terms of capability building, a lot of things uh, which are much more strategic. So this year is going to be extremely important for us. Great. Thank you so much, Manvi, for that. And I uh, echo your sentiment as well. I think 2020 forced us all to take the growth mindset, um, you know, whole angle seriously. Otherwise, there's no way we could um, demonstrate grit or perseverance or none, none of those things. I think as a function, we had to learn that, um, uh, you know, quite uh, intensely. Great. Uh, Chetna, over to you. 2020, uh, for me and our organization, Ericsson, has been a year of realizing, uh, as I said initially, going back to basics. Basics in terms of why and where is LND relevant even in the current scheme of things? Because uh, there was a phase, I would say, particularly towards the you know March, April kind of a phase, where business was actually struggling to, act to keep themselves afloat. Because a lot of customers were rethinking their strategy. A lot of customers themselves didn't know what to do, how to do, when to do things. You know, So it was a complete disruption of the business. Forget about L&D. Now, because of that disruption, uh, many people did not think they have time to get into the, the usual learning mechanics that we were used to. You know, you do a planning in the beginning of the year, but for us is around January, February. So by March, we already were set into execution mode. And by end of March, beginning of April, we realized that everything that was being planned is out of the window, right? So you need to go back because business is reevaluating their priorities, their budget, 
their focus everything so as an lnd function it was time for us to really go back and re-strategize to say if we have to keep relevant as an organization you have to not only address what the business needs but you also need to actually influence the entire culture system how we learn when we learn how much do we need to learn today and how much can we postpone to a later time because the priorities of the business itself have changed right and then going back and saying okay if these are the priorities these are the focus areas we are traditionally you know in india have been focusing a lot on doing training through the classroom mode even though we have probably the biggest uh, access to all the online content but in india the appetite for doing things online or digital was still not very high compared to the other parts of the you know of ericsson but this gave us the opportunity and the confidence to push the digital agenda with much more rigor because people because one classroom training was not an option anymore and there were a lot of people who were skeptical about the efficacy of digital learning particularly in hardcore technical areas because you need a lot of hands on right uh while there are other opportunities available but you needed a lot of negotiating convincing and at at a time positioning it in such a manner that they felt that okay because it's going to be here for a while let's at least try it out and see how it goes it was more like a to at least say it once and then we will know it's not working so we will not have to come back again but thankfully because we had done so much of groundwork and so much of effort that had gone into it a few use cases few success cases gave the confidence not only to us but to all of the stakeholders as this is probably which can be a long term strategy and 2021 as as rightly said by manvi is going to be a very critical year because of to consolidate the gains that you made in 2020 got it great points uh, chetna so um, i'm going to build on what you just mentioned um, in terms of the agility that the team had to demonstrate right by february your plans were all set and uh, come march you had to throw all of that out and respond to this in an agile fashion so can you uh, take us through the biggest challenges faced by your teams during the initial phase those those three months maybe i'll go through the same order uh, as come starting with you so um i just uh, uh, rajiv focus on the first couple of months right, when yeah. we can we hit with this crisis um it was a massive shift because uh, fundamentally for us more than 90 95% of the organization uh, was required to work from home right and that was a pretty big shift from a classical model where one ends up having more than not more than 4 5% of the company working from home right um so the three three four things are really focused on from an lnd lnd perspective first is uh, how does one effectively work from home that itself is a very very big change uh, especially when one keeps in mind our scale um, and especially at the end of the day we are a servicing organization we are not kind of building a product uh, right so there's a nuance of the client that's there there's a nuance of security that is there right? so how does one really work uh, in, from a work from home and how is how does one kind of manage that piece the second big thing that we kind of drove very very aggressively was also around how does a leader or a team manager work with a remote team where everybody is working away from uh, in front of everybody else right that was a pretty big shift right because your daily stuff like your daily stand up meetings so on and so on, all kind of vanished out of the window right because the ways of working were changing right so how so how does the employee work differently how does the manager work differently and last but not the least at that point in time um there was huge amount of uh, stress in the system because everybody was worried about uh, the 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 challenge was there and there was this aspect of managing home there was this aspect of pressure from family right because people are kind of staying away from their homes so on and so forth so the whole aspect of how do i keep myself in the right frame of mind how do i handle stress how do i stay focused right? on the on the personal side of it right so those were three areas uh, as an lnd function we specifically picked up and at rapid pace we put in a lot of e learning modules around it 
casted it, it got the, the CEO, the CHRO rally around it, share the importance of that entire initiative, so on and so forth. Because it was two things, right? One is a personal aspect of an individual. The two other important pieces were around the ways of working because that itself was changed. So this is what we really focused in the first couple of months. And then of course, a lot of other things followed after that, but more for this specific question. Great, thank you, Eskan. Um, Kavita, over to you. So uh, I think in the beginning, right, none of us were really prepared. We just got into it and said, let's do it one day at a time and see where it goes. Uh, the initial impact, you know, is let's just put a lot of content out there so that people can just see what makes sense and let them just do it. But I think as we settled down, even the learning team, and it's not just the learning team, I think the entire HR fraternity and the leaders across the organization, we started calling out saying, hey, what is it that we can really do to add value to the individual, where it is not just learning ours that we are chalking up, but how do we do that? And what can we do to make your lives easy so that you can do that for the larger organization? Uh, so for the larger organization, we rolled out a campaign called DGB, which was digital behaviors. And we said, hey, you still need to do what you're doing. Only it's in a virtual context. So how do you really translate that? Whether it's a meeting, giving feedback, coaching conversations. So we ran that as a series. But specifically for the learning team, I think the challenge that they really felt was uh, missing meeting people in person, right? They were so used to getting into a room, walking across to a group of people and say, hey, we're doing this. What do you think? I think that was something that really, really hit them and still hits us to this day, right? To saying that how can we really, while Zoom is still there, but you do, you miss that personal connect and conversations that could have been resolved in five minutes had to be blocked on calendars with a 30 minute slot where you had polite conversations. So I think people interaction was something that they missed. I think the second thing that really they found difficult to do was, and not just them, but across the organization and maybe across the world is the segregation between working for home and working from home. Uh, how do you really create that black and white line? And everyone had very, very innovative ideas of dealing with it. And we said, hey, do what makes sense for you. We are not really prescribing what needs to be done. These are what, and we gave them that flexibility saying, these are the broad objectives that need to be done. You decide your work day, you work with the hours that make sense for you. Take, you know, you want to have lunch with your kids during their online class break, do that. You know, you don't have to necessarily take the break when, it's the official lunch hour break across the organization. You want a quiet time in the evening, take that. You want to work you know, early hours, late hours. So we gave that level of flexibility. And I think that helped to a large extent with the organization as well as the HR fraternity. Uh, what we consciously did was every month, we brought the HR fraternity together and said, you know, just let your hair down virtually and party. You know, set it up and we would make sure that you know there was uh, food delivered to their houses, there was music playlists set up and we would literally have an online party and we would invite the family as well. Saying, let your hair down because it's tough. We are going through extremely tough times and you're thinking of the entire organization, but this is our small attempt to say, tell you that we are thinking of you as well and giving you an opportunity and a window to just vent. All of this is off the record, so you can just go ahead and crib about whichever manager you want or whichever employee is giving you a hard time and let's just let down our hair and have fun. I think that went uh, to a large extent in just helping easing it out and giving them that comfort that the, uh, that the, the senior leadership within HR uh, was behind them and that they could take certain stances with the larger group, which is the organization. Rajiv, you're on mute. Yeah, I told so, you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, I was just thinking as you were talking about working from home and working for home, if I were to write the digital blurb book this year, I would have talked about that blurring away of the line, right? So yeah. uh, that just crossed my mind. Great. Uh, over to Manvi next. Yeah, so challenges, uh, you know, I agree with the challenges uh, which have been mentioned by the two other panelists. So there were plenty, uh, we were actually, our plan for 2020 was completely in for a classroom uh, mode of training. And uh, that really had to be reworked. We had launched a leadership development program and that was in a classroom mode. And we actually had to move it to into a virtual mode. 
So things were not clear, uh, not sure that when we would be back to office. And this hybrid work model was something that we had not env envisaged and we had not uh, expected the challenges that would come up with it. Then, uh, you know, even facilitating sessions online, we realized that the, the entire, uh, it needs a new set of skills. And we got people trained into virtual facilitation skills training engaging people in a virtual platform. Then uh, we also had uh, actually a lot of online learnings uh, from various uh, you know, learning partners, in, including Nolscape. And uh, you, you know, with such amazing content, the difficulty was getting people to use the course. Because what happens is you know, this learning culture of classroom training and getting into a digital online thing is very something very difficult to you know, establish. It cannot be done overnight. And that needs to be nurtured and cemented by small daily commitments and uh, ongoing uh, encouragement and feedback. So that was the hard work that, uh, that we as LND team had to do. Because proactive learning, if you see, is not something like a, a mindset or instinctive for people. That had to be nurtured. And um, I would say that one of the skills that as LND people we have used extensively is nudging. Nudging people and making them go through the learning, especially an online learning. So nudging is something uh, I feel that is number one quality which uh, LNT professional needs to have because you know people if you see left on uh, on your own your learners will not uh, complete the learning module you need to nudge them uh, and you need to use that nudging principles to get people to learn better this is what my, I learned awesome great points uh, Chetna <laughs> what you I think most of uh, what my other co-panelists have said is very similar to what we face. I'll just add a couple of things. Uh, one of the things we realized, uh, I would say, you know, in the second month of the pandemic was that before we even go ahead and tell our stakeholders what to do, how to do, I think first we have to set our, uh, you know, things in place in terms of our own technology orientation. Not many of us knew a lot of tools and the, the functionality that are already available because we never had to use it, right? For example, we use uh, Microsoft Teams predominantly as a meeting and then eventually it also became, became our go-to tool for delivering training. And we realize that there are so many functions and features that are available in that, but because there was never a need for it, we always limited ourselves to use, it to use the very basic functions that were available. So even before we went ahead and uh, got our you know, trainers and our vendor partners and our employees more tuned to how to use these tools more effectively, because practically you are using MS Teams for at least seven to eight hours a day for your meetings, for your discussions, for your informal, formal catch-ups and every, pretty much everything. But do you even know how to, for example, do you know how to use the breakout room functionality in that? Right? And many other things. Whiteboard. Whiteboarding is one function which I swear by now. Right? But that was something, I don't know whether it was available before or we just realized it was there even you know, last year. But the fact is that what we realized as a team is, you know, it's very easy to go ahead and tell your employees that, you know, why don't you do this, 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 this. But if you've not done it yourself, you cannot be convincing. Right? So one is, you know, before you preach others, do it yourself, get that confidence that this is how it works. These are the four pitfalls you have to be careful about. And then when you actually have, have a dialogue around it, then you are much more effective in that conversation. Point number one. Point number two, as I said, we already had a very good library of online content with us. But I think last year in the pandemic, it gave us the opportunity to actually look at that content much more minutely, right? And curate that content to what is relevant and what 
else we need, which may not be there, but we need to source it. So the lot of focus on what was available, we actually reached out to most of our online partners like Coursera and you know the others, and we extended, you know, uh, some subscription functionalities and the features to our. I'm sure they would have done that for most of their customers. And as a result of that, what we realized was that if you are able to curate the right content for the right need and push it across in an effective manner, things weren't as difficult as we thought they would be. And before third or fourth month that we were into the pandemic, we realized that we are not in a very bad spot. Because when the classroom training as an option was no longer available with us everybody was they had panicked not only in the you know the the larger employees but even the lnd team that how do we do it because we don't have any option to do a classroom training right the the upside of it is that because i lead a global organization we realized that there is so much more opportunity to club different geographies together in that interaction for example india and china or nearby geography where the time difference is not more than a couple of hours earlier you were doing dedicated sessions for all of these people now when you are able to club them the conversations were much more meaningful and indirectly the leaders of those teams and the teams themselves they realize that how much more they got to know those teams and i would say the same for myself the number of virtual connects i have done one on one you know not only with my team but my stakeholders i think it is at least two to three times i would have done in the normal uh, you know course of the year Got it. and that gave us the opportunity to know the stakeholders in a much more vulnerable time and that was i think an eye opening thing for everybody because we saw a more human side of everybody lot of empathy i think empathy is one key word which i would say was 2020s you know underlined thing everything whether it is as a team lead as an employee as a manager as a leadership team the the bottom line was how do you do the same thing but with a lot of empathy got it so that's a keyword that ramya had used to describe uh, 2020 up front um so we we spoke about the impact of all of this on the organization on your own teams what did you have to do to face the challenge now looking at this whole situation from a learner perspective so i'm building on what uh, kavita mentioned earlier in terms of fomo right um, this happened to me i don't know if it happened to you in the first 3 um, months uh, i i cut down my travel like crazy obviously like everybody else i was glued to one seat uh, for those many months uh, so i made a list of things that i always wanted to do but never had the time to do it it included uh, learning magic tricks um, so i i just scanned the a um, wide array of things that i wanted to do and i subscribed mm-hmm. to multiple things like masterclass.com and this and that and uh, after the first 2 3 months and i went back and checked that list it was down to maybe two or three things that i really cared about and right now after almost a year now it's probably down to one thing that i actually want to do so this is from a learner perspective i'm talking about me as a person uh, what did you learn about how learners responded to this um obviously as kavita mentioned initially there was this anxiety i want to learn and we were all providing resources how did that change if at all over the last one year or so um i ask kant ortiu of uh, thanks again rajiv I, i think we should change the order for the next question in next one i'm going to change it yes <laughs> right so i i think um, you know for us one belief got further un- underlined very very strongly that uh, the whole concept of the 70 20 10 principle that majority of the learning happens on the job when somebody is working on it 24 by 7 and the realization that as an lnd function we are playing more an enabling role in that journey so which is the 10% i think that realization was extremely extremely important for us um because 
first and foremost, it was important for people to understand that, hey, I would learn what is relevant for me. Uh, I would learn at my own pace. Help me with the technology, which is stable, which is strong, which is robust, so that I can learn when I wish to learn. I think these three uh, feedback came loud and clear. Now, luckily for us, uh, I mean, we did not know COVID was going to hit us so badly, but we had invested in a very, very strong technology platform using some portal, which kind of helped us in this journey. But from a learner's perspective that, let me be, I'm learning on the job, provide me with the environment, provide me with the tools, provide me with the technology, guide me when I need your help, was, was for me the most key theme that came out of it. Um, loud and clear from our employees, right? So in fact, small things like, for example, historically we've always chased you know, completion rate. Yeah. And say, you know, great, great job done, 100% completion. We have kind of stopped looking at some of those metrics altogether because that's not what the learner wants because you can you cannot really push somebody beyond the point to learn. Right? The second thing was more around having a more holistic conversation on learning right? because and that kind of came uh, from our employees. But hey, how can this become part of my appraisal conversations? How can this become part of my day-to-day uh, -day conversations with my manager? Right? So we kind of we are kind of involved those elements in beyond just the learning function, but even the broader talent management areas that comes in from the life cycle of an employee's perspective to weave this whole story in. But the message for me as, as the as the LND leader of the unit is help me, but I let me learn at my own pace. And don't bother me too much beyond a point. Awesome. Sounds good. Uh, pick up on this point that you just mentioned, right? One is um, earlier we were using certain input metrics uh, like completion rate and all of that, right? Uh, but it's great that in today's context, learners themselves are saying, let me learn, but tell me how is this connected to my uh, my performance, to my conversations on the job. So it seems like COVID accelerated the thing that l and function always wanted to do in terms of shifting the focus from completion rate to actual performance on the job. Absolutely. So, yeah, so rest of the panelists. Yeah, go, go on, uh, Eskan. I'm sorry, I said I'm done. Yeah, please, please go ahead. All right, cool. Yeah, so rest of the panelists, we can weigh in on uh, this particular point on the metrics that you're now tracking and uh, what, what change are you noticing in the learner? I'm going to shuffle the, the, the order now. Manvi, you want to go next? Yeah, so I I would, uh, you know, kind of agree with, uh, you know, what Ayes Khan said. And we have actually uh, also experimented with informal learning, I would say, you know, something which is non-structured learning, non-mandated by the organization. Uh, uh, we have actually seen that uh, what we did uh, during this pandemic is that we actually had our LMS, which was mainly used to drive our classroom learning in terms of you know uh, getting feedback and all. But what we did is that we started uh, you know twice a month we started putting uh, stuff which was available from open source and it where well, it was a podcast it could be uh, you know related to uh, you know some learning things were identified at the beginning of month and we used to put some videos podcasts articles and it was so amazing to see that how people actually wait for that friday afternoon when it gets posted and by monday tuesday when we used to check we used to see huge number of people using it and sharing the feedback on the discussion boards so this was something very very good especially it is very important for uh, you know senior leaders in the organization who were actually too stuck on on the classroom thing they would always think that learning can happen only in the classroom so that has has moved out and there are people who are actually latching on to learning. So when we have invested on a LMS or a LXP, you can see that how people are engaging and using on this. So we and this insight, even if we are not tracking this informal learning, this is actually giving us insights into the interest areas, the study patterns and the engaging formats of people. So that itself is extremely good. What we have seen, which has come out as a real learning needs, because if you see the uh, retail sector has really got impacted by this uh, pandemic and there are a lot of jobs uh, where reskilling needs to be done. And we would actually have to spend some time 
so this kind of a scenario is actually telling us how will people learn if we have to drive a few key learning agendas or key trends of learning in the retail sector that we have seen how do we drive that to have a meaningful and engaging learning so that is something that we we are able to see that through this exercise got it got it yeah that's a great point chetna over to you i think one of the first things that we realized is that you know at least in our organization uh, we tend to make lot of things quite complicated right and uh, you know and what the learners were repeatedly asking for is can you make it simple can you break it down into smaller steps which are easy for me to follow right we as lnd uh, over a period of time because we get so used to doing things in a particular manner uh, we unnecessarily you know complicate things which can be quite simply done so one of the things that we took up as a you know initiative or a project in the middle of last year is we looked at all our internal processes because what we did was we ran a yammer campaign where we actually reached out to our learners so every day for i think more than a month the entire team uh, you know the lnd team globally uh, we we ran a campaign where we reached out to learners to understand what do they want from lnd which we are probably not even aware about which is beyond planning their trainings which they have asked us to what is it that they are liking about it what is it that they find cumbersome and they would want us to look into what is it that is working for them what is it that is definitely not working for them so the starting point was go back to your audience and note down what is it that you need to work upon because normally we are so busy in the you know in executing what we need to execute we don't step back to reflect so we consciously did that last year and based on the input that we had as i said one of the things which came loud and clear is there is definitely a need to simplify things so we took up a project called quest for easy where we looked at most of our internal processes and which are the ones which take maximum time which are the ones where you have maximum number of handshakes right and is there an opportunity for us to simplify some of that right it was a very because you know those are things which nobody wants to get into least of all lnd because you're so busy in running the system but i think uh, after two to and a half months of looking at and scrutinizing all that we were doing the way we were doing how effective it was and correlating it to you know the feedback that we had received we were amazed how much time we were able to save by simply reusing certain things and redoing certain things in a different way than the way we had been used to doing it awesome so, so that was a aha moment that okay why did we not do it 3 years back and we could have saved so much of time and effort absolutely it brings to mind my mind couple of things you must have seen this meme a funny one that is floating around who accelerated digital transformation in an organization option <laughs> yeah. b option a option b ceo uh, cio and then there is covid 19 covid yeah i think the same thing could be said about lnd as well in a lot of ways the way we are talking about hey we listen to the learner we uh, uh, ran a yama campaign or uh, we personalized learning and all of that stuff and and learners finally saying okay you've enabled me to askan's point as well you've enabled me let me do my stuff but tell me how this is connected to my performance so those are i think eventually the things that we've been working towards as an industry it's great that i think that mindset is coming in um, and so we have something to thank covid for for that uh, kavita over to you so uh, i'm you know i think for us the largest learning was and it, i'm thankful to covid in that sense because i was hired to transform the way things happen at usd and uh, covid just helped me land all of those uh, deliverables very very easily right so everything that could happen i would just say you know we need to do it that way because it's just easier uh, for me the biggest learning was when i saw the impact that it had on interlinking all the hr processes uh, we firmly believed that uh, there were some shifts that we needed to do so the first shift we were doing was 
making the shift from training to learning. We said, you know, don't train yourselves anymore. Start learning. And we said, we will create frameworks that will facilitate that kind of learning. And then we said, now we will let you own not just your learning, but also your careers. So we will not mandate the learning hours anymore, but we will say, for this particular job that you want to do, if we have a career management tool that we have internally that allows people to really see how their careers can span out within the organization, basis their current role. And if they want to change tracks, how those different tracks would look like. So we said, hey, you want to do that? These are some of the learning interventions that would help you on your way. These are some of the certifications that will help you on your way if you choose to do that. But no longer can you just sit back and say that, you know, oh, I'm a software developer, but I wanted to be an architect and no one helped me. We are laying it out for you. We're saying we will support you on that journey, but you need to make that effort and put in the time. So I think that was a shift. That, that entire shift of mind came not only with the learner, but it also came with the managers, where the managers and HR had that power saying, you know, if I like you and you are really nice to me, I'll make sure you reach that space where we are really democratizing the entire process of learning, making it like almost an open talent marketplace, saying, hey, you work with your skills, present yourself and move into roles that work. So I think everyone had a few aha moments and I was very happy at the end of the day. Awesome. That's great. So I, I wish this, this could go on and on. I'm sure Ramya is also itching to present her insights. Uh, uh, so... I'm seeing a lot of interesting comments on the chat window as well. That's something I would request all the participants to do. Um, you know, what's the biggest thing that you're taking away from this conversation? If you can post that on the chat window, I think it'll benefit everybody. And we'll take the questions a little later. Uh, so before I wrap up this uh, this segment, I'd like one word again, uh, one word to describe 2021. This time we'll start with Chetna. Consolidate. Consolidate. Okay, Manvi. Uh, hopeful, optimistic. Okay. Awesome. awesome. <laughs> Kavita? Resilience. Resilience. Ayas Khan? Vaccine. Vaccine. <laughs> yeah, fingers crossed on that one. Okay, great. Thank you so much, uh, all panelists, uh, for your wonderful insights. Uh, we'll have some question and answers from our participants. Uh, do stay, stay on. Uh, in the meantime, I'd love to... Um, introduce and welcome uh, Ramya to present her uh, findings. Uh, she ran uh, the study over the last um, uh, three months, spoke to various industry leaders across industries, um, you know, across um, multiple geographies as well. So she has some interesting insights for all of us. And Ramya leads, um, you know, customer success function for us at Nolscape. Over to you, Ramya. Sure. Thank you. Thanks, Rajiv. Um, uh, is my screen visible? I think that's the next uh, thing after you're on mute. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. So uh, I'm just going to quickly summarize the report findings that we've had. I think most of what you, uh, what we have spoken in the last one hour uh, is what has been consolidated into the findings here. So um, just going to uh, talk about the 10 insights that you can uh, take away from this report. Uh, the first one is uh, L&D is viewed as a strategic function. I think many of you uh, spoke about uh, uh, how it became so imperative with changing priorities, with changing business needs, uh, you know, finding new opportunities uh, amidst the pandemic, how uh, L&D can support, uh, you know, the business uh, function. So it became uh, super important. So again, backed by our research data, almost 55% uh, of uh, the uh, you know repo uh, respondents reported that uh, you know that this this is not just uh, you know helping employees survive this uh, pandemic but it's also thrive in the pandemic right so that's something that um, uh, we we got as uh, response uh, the second important thing again um, we we all spoke about this uh, about upskilling and reskilling need it's not new, it's not a new thing it's it's always been there uh, it's just that it was crunched and accelerated in the last one year uh, again, uh, uh, many of the topics that you mentioned, right? So uh, things that we usually used to do, uh, like sales, for example, where we do uh, physically, how, how am I able to do the same thing uh, remotely, right? So a lot of new uh, trends, a lot of new skills uh, that were required to you know, match what the business needs were at that moment. Um, so again, um, you know, almost 76% of them said that internal mobility needs are on the rise. Uh, like Kavita also mentioned in terms of uh, creating this talent marketplace internally, giving them what they want to learn, uh, you know, anytime, anywhere sort of learning, but also giving them the opportunity to move around uh, based on uh, their skill set, right? So that that was, um, again, on the rise. Um, 
the third interesting part uh, is is that our l and d budgets were initially slashed the first few months uh, you know that we wanted uh, the businesses require requested l and d teams to do more uh, with less but uh, over the fa you know fag end of the year uh, right now in the last couple of quarters um, so uh, we understand that the budgets are bouncing back uh, slowly uh, as the businesses are also doing better and the vaccine is uh, here perhaps so uh, almost 70% of them said that it was decreased initially but it's now moving on to uh, a positive trend of uh, you know re returning back of the budgets as well um the fourth part rajiv uh, cracked the joke already so uh, this uh, sort of accelerated investment in the digital infrastructure so companies uh, which sort of uh, uh, were able to foresee uh, such a request right so the platform was in place uh, uh, the the content were, were in place uh, but the adoption was not so much right so because it was still high on classroom training uh, but what the pandemic did was because everything needs to be done virtually uh, what we saw was a lot of adoption happened over uh, infrastructure uh, building for organizations especially in the learning space so again uh, 80% 80% of them said all of their structured um, uh, sorry structured in classroom programs were all converted to virtual uh, the initial 2 3 months where we thought it's going to be just for 4 5 months uh, you know delayed running these programs still wanted to do classroom programs but then uh, when we when we came to june july uh, we thought it's going to be longer um, so then that's when i think most of the organizations converted from uh classroom training to uh, virtual uh, blended uh, program as well um so this was a pretty interesting ins insight uh, right so one is actually moving the classroom training to a virtual blended training so that's that's a giveaway right we we had to run uh, run the show but what was interesting is um, how it's it's not plug and play right we are not taking the same classroom session the same format the same um you know curriculum um the, the the same format the activities that you do uh, you can't deploy the same thing over virtual uh, uh, when you deliver them virtually so what we understand uh, from the uh, uh, insight or the report is is that uh, they had to reimagine the entire uh, experience of a learner in a virtual blend uh, virtual learning format right right from the duration right from the tools that we use engage uh, for engagement all of these are leading to the learning effectiveness which in which in turn means performance uh, metrics that we are looking at so how can organizations reimagine how their classroom experience uh, can be shifted to uh, virtual ways of learning so uh, surprisingly um, 31% of them said that uh, we were able to measure till level 4 uh, when we asked probe deeper what what was uh, interesting to notice uh, we were uh, they were able to bring uh, experts from outside otherwise which might have been difficult that's number one again there is no geographical limitations right like like one of you said uh, we were able to uh, deploy across multiple geographies uh, which means access to experts across geographies were were also available right so they were able to create the same level of impact the business impact through learning um, so so 31% of them said that it it, it is it was indeed uh, possible for them to run the show right uh, at, at that level right um the other one i think all of us uh, spoke about is the high tech high touch approach while there is infrastructure while there is there is digital learning there is no dearth of content a uh, lot of co content available online uh, you know procured internally by the organization uh, but but what really worked is uh, not just the high tech approach uh, the, the one that most of them refer to is the blended learning format which is both a human and a technology touch uh, is the only way that uh, the, the the you know the programs will become more Uh, effective in nature so almost 80% of them said uh, a human uh, plus technology based approach is is the right way to go about um, you know learning so that's uh, insight 6 uh, 7 uh, um, so like like uh, most of us uh, spoke about here is uh, virtual blended learning is here to stay uh, but what is also interesting is uh, how how much of this is actually going to retain post pandemic right so uh, from our understanding from our report uh, what what majority of them mentioned that while virtual blended learning is here to stay but uh, you know 50% of what they have been converted to virtual may go back to classroom training right so uh, because the infrastructure has been uh, laid or laid and because we have found uh, better ways of learning uh, because we were we were able to conserve cost uh, having all these benefits some of uh, some programs uh, are still uh, need to be done uh, through classroom classroom mode and and that's something that um, uh, the split between the classroom and virtual blended learning is going to change uh, for a long term uh, impact right so that's something that um, we understood from uh, the respondents 
uh, and last one, like Chetna mentioned, we we never knew Microsoft Teams have has so many features uh, until uh, we had to really really use it. So most of them referred to um, Teams being the most um, sorted after medium to run uh, learning programs, uh, whiteboarding, all of that quizzing, um, all of that that you uh, that that all of you mentioned uh, were all inbuilt into the platform, and most of them preferred uh, 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 Microsoft Teams to be used as a learning uh, method or uh, mode of delivery. Last couple of things, top three challenges uh, from the L&D perspective. Uh, number one, um, so they had to shoulder additional responsibilities uh, apart from learning, planning for learning. Uh, there are other responsibilities around employee well-being, mental health, uh, you know, ex employee experience. All of they, all of these were also, uh, you know, part of uh, L&D team's uh, responsibilities. Um, second, uh, the most, most challenging part many of them mentioned is around conversion of their classroom programs into a, a great virtual learning experience. Um, so there are many, many such uh, activities and tools that uh, L&D teams leveraged uh, to make, uh, to create a great learner experience uh, while doing things remotely. But uh, that seemed to be the most uh, uh, toughest part in, in actually my pivoting to, uh, you know, virtual learning. And the third thing, uh, I think um, uh, Manvi also uh, brought up, right? So the informal ways of learning, curating content. So again, while there is no dearth of content availability, but how do you curate it so that it becomes more relevant for the uh, learners? And, and also do more with less. So can you, you know, construct a learning path or a learning journey with multiple, uh, uh, you know, content sources, right? So they were looked upon to create uh, or curate uh, such courses for uh, the learners inside the organization. So these were probably the top three challenges that we heard from the, uh, from the respondents. Uh, on, on that note, what are some topics uh, that were on demand? Um, employee happiness and mental health, uh, mental well-being uh, seem to be on the rise. Um, the second one is everything remote, right? Right from the productivity, how can I make my teams work remotely uh, well? Second, remote team management, uh, how do I handle uh, teams virtually? Uh, remote selling and remote collaboration, right? So how do I foster all of this uh, seems to be uh, the most sought after topic in many of the organizations that we spoke to. And the third part uh, that we also heard is the diversity and inclusion. Um, a few organizations also mentioned that uh, uh, while while the pandemic while the pandemic has uh, done a few things, uh, some of the things trends that they see internally uh, uh, not so positive trend is around how women are uh, in attrition rate, right? So where they're at the if they look at the attrition split that they have, uh, women were mostly on the on the higher side, right? So leaving jobs uh, because of the pandemic. So how do we how do L&D teams uh, can create an uh, an a learning environment, a learning culture that you know fosters inclusivity and and diversity as well? So uh, these are some topics again uh, were very uh, very much on demand during uh, the last uh, eleven to twelve months uh, is 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 the findings that we have. Uh, on that note, uh, for for all the deep dive of each of these insights, um, so we. You can download the report uh, on this link. Um, so I'm going to uh, paste uh, this uh, link on the chat window as well. So uh, you can get the full copy of the report from uh, this link here. So I'm, I'm just uh, going to uh, share this on the chat window. And uh, uh, that's it from my end. Uh, over to you, uh, Rajiv. All right. Thank you so much, Ramya. Uh, 10 insights in 10 minutes. Uh, so thank you so much for the pace at which you went through. and. Um, I'm sure there is a lot more richness to the uh, the report itself uh, that you can uh, that you can experience when you download it. Uh, please go to the link that has been posted on the chat window, and um, I see a flurry of questions on the chat window. So I, I want to be able to do maximum justice to this. Um, I think one recurring question is from an, from the LND community that is, what are the three skills that LND folks have to develop uh, to stay relevant and stay on top of all of this? Kavita, I'm going to give that question to you. I just typed out the response on chat so that everyone could see it. I thought I'll save you some time. So okay. if you want to just move to the next question, go ahead. I've already put those uh, insights there. and people Sure, can. sure. That's some parallel processing going on here. Uh, the answer is already on the chat window. Please have a look. Um, all right, let's uh, move on to another question here. Uh, how are we measuring the impact? Uh, so this is from um, Shachi Call. Uh, what are the metrics used by Lindy for measuring functional uh, competencies, learning hours per learner, spend per learner, training effectiveness alone? Uh, so uh, who would like to take this up? From a functional uh, topics perspective, how are we measuring the effectiveness? I think somebody spoke about hands-on. Uh, I think Chetna, you probably mentioned this very call correctly. 
uh, that it's a little hard to measure the effectiveness of that. Would, would you like to comment on this? Rajiv, so the effectiveness comment. of learning, I think there are a couple of things uh, in my mind that, uh, you know, can be and needs to be probably looked at. One is, uh, what is the learning reach? How many people have been able to access your learning rather than the number of hours? Uh, but even more important to me is whatever learning is being done, irrespective of the quantum, what is the impact it's creating? Uh, it should be ideally linked to some of the business imperatives. For example, uh, how has LND or the upskilling or the initiatives delivered through LND? Is there a way to say that this is a contribution of LND in maybe consolidating some kind of a sales pipeline that we have a visibility to? Because there are certain skills which you get a, you know, you get a heads up from the sales team, and you have a good chance of getting into that project based on the current skill set availability versus the desired skill set availability. So. If we somewhere start moving towards that in terms of saying that because of these many people who have undergone these many upskilling or reskilling or whatever program, these are the kind of opportunities as a sales function or as a delivery function we've been able to aim at. Rather than saying that these many people have gone through for so many hours and also what mm -hmm. is the outcome of people going through a training in what we need? We are losing Chetna there. I don't know. Am I audible? Yeah, or? You're, you're back now. You're back now. Okay. Yeah. So I was saying rather than looking at those numbers, uh, such as number of people trained, number of hours people have gone through the training, the way I would look at it is whatever people uh, and whatever number of hours of training people have gone through, how has that helped the business? Getting new business, consolidating the existing business, you know, so I think those are the numbers we should be measured on. And I think many, many organizations, particularly in the technology and IT space are actually moving towards that. Got it, got it. Thank you so much. And thanks Kavita for uh, typing out your answers for the other questions. Please keep an eye on the chat window. It's pretty efficient use of time. So now um, uh, going to one more question that's being asked here in terms of learner engagement. Manvi, maybe you can take that up because where you said uh, there may have been some resistance to digital learning, uh, especially from senior leaders. What are some things that you're uh, using to uh, keep them engaged? Uh, you know, there is, uh, I would say, a lot of things in terms of the variety of uh, the content which we share. Second is, you know, the relevance, uh, like, for example, in our, uh, like, there was one of the questions uh, uh, which uh, somebody had asked that what is the content that, you, uh, that you're giving to people, especially in content uh, customer facing roles. So we have also tried to put uh, stuff which is relevant uh, in the sense that if you see uh, uh, like online consumer behavior in retail has suddenly become very, very important. So we need to understand analytics, digital fluency, all that becomes very, very important. So what we have done is that we have also, we, we put relevant content and also micro learning modules because people like to learn in small chunks. So the, and especially in our, uh, the group that we have in our organization, there are a lot of millennials and Gen Z. So giving uh, small chunks of learning in terms of micro learning. So this is what we do. Awesome, great. Um, I think we are almost at the top of the hour. Uh, thank you so much panelists for all your insights. Um, I'm walking away with copious notes here. I was furiously taking notes uh, of everything that you said. Thank you so much for your insights and thanks Ramya for launching the report. Uh, great work and a lot of effort has gone into it. I'm, I'm really proud of uh, what you put together. And thank you all uh, the participants for spending this time with us and great questions. And I hope um, you, you've taken a lot of value from this uh, one hour we've spent together. And once again, thank you everyone.